1260. I'd like to call this meeting to order. We do have a number of late items, uh, uh, and we have under item agenda item 7, staff reports, we have a letter that's been submitted uh, from the uh, West Bay Investments Limited, and under uh, uh, we need to add to the agenda item 11, a rise in report. And we'll renumber the uh, agenda after that uh, as appropriate. And I have two announcements that I'd like to make. So if I can get a motion to approve that agenda as uh, amended. So in the second, thank you. All those in favor. Thank you. My, my first uh, announcement is a congratulations to Councillor Brain, who sought election as a director for the Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities. And she was successful, and uh, we, we want to congratulate her. I will tell you that uh, as you start to get into these larger associations, they need people like uh, Councillor Brain, who is always making sure things get done. So we are well represented and I know that uh, the council members that went with her were very supportive of her uh, and we congratulate you. <coughs> Thank you. My, my council often says to me, no surprises, thank you, but tonight I have a surprise for them because this is Poetry Month, and we actually uh, have a very special, I have a very special poem to read to you. And it was written by Miss Dorothy Sims, who was born on Constance Avenue in Esquimalt in 1920. And the reason I want to read it to you is because it's our centennial, because it's uh, Poetry Month, and because it's entitled Esquimalt in the Pink. And if I wait one more week, we, all of those blossoms may be gone. She wrote this in spring of 1987, and I apologize if I don't do it justice in the reading. Esquimalt is wearing pink today, although spring is still to come, and March early in its month, Esquimalt is wearing pink today. The lawn's velvet green, still wearing winter untidy grass and waiting for correction are no match in the contrast of early pink. Just think in pink, in many, many shades, a visual confection. In gardens, on boulevards, and as around Sax Point Park, lingering on the way I go, it's as if folk from fairyland are putting on a show. The streets are lined in gorgeous rows with treats, trees whose blossoms pink in the breeze gaily wink Suddenly, stronger wind blows a blast, and now we have pink snow. I saw a sparrow, chickadee, and starling, patiently turning over petal on the ground, gobbling every tiny grub they found. To them it was a fantasy of spring. Overnight, heavy drops of rain have spat, beating the blossoms into a sodden nap that quickly turns to brown. This later I discover as I walk around the town. And the trees are starkly robbed of all their fluffs so pink. And this child of nature sobbed, a protest, soaring for all, though, all that could not stay, sorrowing the generosity and spit of nature's way. This brief interlude of nature, where she painted all with pink, in my grateful heart I think, I will always carry the picture of a squamal in the pink. I hope that there were copies for the public, uh, and we have provided this for our website for our centennial, uh, because they did submit some other poems uh, uh, on her behalf. And thank you for indulging me. We now move on to the minutes of the special meeting of Council April 2nd and the regular meeting of Council April 2nd. And I need a motion, Council, to uh, adopt those minutes. So moved. Thank you. Seconder? Second. Are there errors, omissions, or changes required? 
Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. The motion is carried. Thank you very much. We move on to public input. This is on items listed on the agenda, excluding items which are up in the subject of public hearing. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak? I don't need the microphone. I'm your Dan Owens, Guaymo Road. I just wanted to say that once again I attended the gigantic grass sale um, Saturday, and I've been to just about, I don't think I've missed any. This was so well done. Jillian needs a big bouquet. Uh, there was tons and tons of people, 84 tables, uh, extremely well organized. The biggest crowd I've ever seen. I even earned $110 and all I felt so good at this rate. But anyway, uh, Jillian, she walked up and down the aisle uh, all day long. She socialized with the visitors, she socialized with us, and she really deserves a big hand. Thanks very much. Thank you, Muriel, for uh, pointing that out because that was something that I wanted to mention and say thank you as well. And so I really appreciate you bringing that up. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak? Any other members of the public that wish to speak? Any other members of the public that wish to speak? Well, we'll get on to what you're all here for. <coughs> the 2012 property tax presentation. Ms. Hurst. jump right in uh, to where we left off. Um, actually, I'm going to uh, go further back to where we left off at our last meeting. So we, in the meantime, between our last meeting and now, have received our um, final grant goals that have our federal properties on them and all properties that we get um, payments in the taxes. So the numbers have changed slightly. Um, I will cover for the scenarios that I presented the last time. I will go through those and update those. Um, in addition, Council had some extensive discussion and, and gave some direction to staff to formulate some further scenarios to present to you. Um, I tried to narrow it down as much as I could. Um, the direction was very general, so um, there were an infinite number of possibilities. I've narrowed them down to um, eight. <laughs> And I'll take you through this tonight. So, um, so starting uh, with the presentation that we had had last meeting, the tax rate multiples. We went through that; those haven't changed. The um, assessed values on the revised roll for municipal properties have not changed. Those numbers are the same. The numbers, the assessed values that changed are um, are, are federal uh, grant roll properties. So we've we've had some final numbers on those. So scenario one, as you remember last time, was 2.49% um, tax increase, which resulted in a $173,000 surplus. Um, when I redo those numbers, um, these the tax rates uh, stay the same for 2.49, but when I apply them to the pulp properties, we now only have a surplus of $169,000. So that's how the, it impacted, those new numbers impacted. So scenario one is still the same as it was last time, it's just that the end surplus is slightly lower than it was at our last meeting. So that remains to be, that's remains scenario one. Scenario two, as we presented um, at the last meeting, um, was where we, scenario two was that we took um, the contingency and capital projects reserve fund and put them back up to historic levels and then took the remainder of uh, the surplus, which is now uh, $59,000, and reduced the tax increase. That now translates to 2.23%. Um, when applied, when, when taking into account the public properties. Um, so that has changed slightly. Um, we had 2.21 percent of the previous meeting, but 2.21 percent doesn't work now with the lower health assessments. It leaves us in a deficit position, so I had to increase that to 2.23. So we have scenario one at 2.49, scenario two at 2.23. Um, the other 
change. So scenario three that we presented last at the last meeting was where we kept um, the contingency in the capital project reserve fund at the reduced amount, and um, we just took the hundred and sixty-nine thousand dollars and said we don't need to collect it. That results now in a one point seven five percent tax increase. As you recall, at the last meeting that was one point seven three. So that's how our built properties uh, assessed values have impacted those previous assessments or the, the previous scenarios. So that's scenario one, two, and three. And I went through those fairly quickly because we went through those in detail at the last meeting. Just some slight changes um, due to the changes in assessments. So also at the last meeting, we, um, after council's discussion, there was a scenario four that, that I put out there. And um, so I, I put that to paper just to show you what that looks like. So scenario four was um, having a 2.49% uh, tax increase for all classes except the business class of property. So if we took um, <coughs> surplus funds, if we took the contingency and capital project reserve fund, put them back up to previous levels, then we're left with still a surplus of 59,000. If we say, we don't need to collect that 59000 but we're just not going to collect it from the business class. Get, they get the full benefit of that 59000 This is the scenario that results. You end up with a tax revenue increase for business class of 1.56 rather than 2.49. Um, the downside of this scenario is that um, while you have surplus funds of $59,000, only 20000 of that applies to your municipal properties. You lose $38,000 in built for this scenario. And that's what I was referring to at our last meeting where I said you have to take into account the proportional impact that a pilt property has. And I think it was Councillor Bray who, who asked if I could come up with that number off the top of my head. I couldn't, but now this is, this is what that looks like. And, and that's why in my report I don't recommend doing this because we have such a loss in our pilt revenues when we do this in isolation. Um, the other uh, thing that happens is you see down near the bottom of the page. You know, uh, I haven't balanced exactly the zero because it's almost impossible to do that. If I came within 500 to $800 of balancing, um, that's where I stopped because I couldn't get any closer without uh, throwing things off. But also when you, when, you, um, when you adjust one tax rate for one property class, the shift in the tax burden from health properties to your municipal properties also changes. So here, under this scenario, you'll see the um, second um, section from the bottom, the ratios. The percentage for 2012, 61.48 and 38.52. That's um, how much of our tax revenue comes from municipal properties and how much comes from PILT. In this scenario, if you adjust just your business tax, or business class properties, your um, shift in tax burden goes from 38.58% from PELP properties down to 38.52, which means you're, you're shifting your tax burden onto your municipal properties by doing this, which is the second reason I'm saying that, that it, doing this in isolation of a long-term strategy and knowing the financial impacts is probably not a good business decision. Um, not that it's not a good business decision to consider doing this, but we need to figure out how to do it in a smart way and how not to shift that tax burden to our municipal properties, is, is what I'm saying. Um, and I think in my, in my report, I also refer to that. If we have this master plan that, we're, that staff are developing for economic development and we're able to use the legislation under the Kearney Charter to develop revitalization areas, then you can develop tax rates for which an area gets an exemption from them, but they still apply to the public properties. So that way you don't shift that tax burden. So, um, and I'll show that further as we go through. So this was the scenario four that I, I, I sort of threw out there off the top of my head, but we didn't have the numbers for it. But this is, this is how that looks. Um, and you can see the business class property goes from paying under the 2.49%, they were paying $239 more than they paid last year. Under this scenario, they pay $150 more. But you have to recognize that you, you lose $40,000 of that $59,000 and you shift the burden to your municipal properties. So I thought this would be interesting. This, I didn't even do the numbers per property on this because it's just a, a, a totally um, non-feasible uh, scenario. But what it really shows is the impact of the built property. So what I did is 
I took. Um, I increased everybody but the, but the business class by 2.49%. And we, so then, all right, and I took the entire um, uh, surplus and applied it to um, the business properties, which then reduces them, as you can see, it reduces the tax increase to a negative 5.19. So if you, you this, this shows that you don't have a linear relationship with your health properties. You can't just say, oh gee, under 2.49, we have a surplus of 169,000, let's not collect $169,000. If you don't collect $169,000 from your municipal property, <coughs> you end up with a deficit of $316,000. That's the impact of your Pell properties on adjusting tax rate. I just thought this was interesting to show the impact of, um, of how non-linear the relationship is between the properties. So we won't even consider this as an option because we would have a $400,000 deficit, but I just it was an interesting example to go through. So, um, so the real scenario five, so taking um, the direction from council um, from the last meeting, which was um, basically in general, no, no property class will experience higher than a 2.49% increase, but um, have some examples where we can give a benefit to the business class. So I went through a couple of scenarios doing that. Scenario five, Scenario five, what I did is, is I had a 2.49% increase for all classes except business. I reduced, I kept the, the contingency and the capital project reserve fund at the reduced amounts that are currently in the budget. And I took the full surplus of 169,000 and said, okay, I don't need to collect that $169,000. As you can see here, um, the tax decrease to business would be 0.19%. But what that really means, and as you see here, it balances within $449. But what you don't see is that um, out of the $169,000, your municipal properties see $59,000. You lose $110,000 in health. And the shift in tax burden goes from 38.58% to 38.4%. So that, um, that means that 0.16% of the tax burden is shifted to your municipal properties. So that's scenario five. So then I went on, and you can see here what it, what it means for your business class is that they pay $18 less than they paid last year, which would be, it seems attractive on the surface, but not when you consider all the other impacts that it has. <coughs> scenario six. So I went from scenario five and I said, okay, what, what else can we do here? We can take um, all the classes except business and increase them by the 2.49%. I can keep the capital projects reserve fund and the capital project reserve fund at the reduced level and just increase the contingency. We'll bump that contingency back up to the $250,000 that it has been at historical levels. <coughs> and then I just use the $119,000 in um, surplus for the business. And under this scenario, you see the tax increase to businesses is an increase of 0.6%. Um, balance is within $165, but um, out of the $119,000, your municipal properties, your municipal businesses only see $41,000 of that. The other $77,000 or $77,000 plus is a reduction to your vote. And the tax burden shifts from 38.58 to 38.45. So, um, so then I went to scenario seven. And scenario seven um, was I kept I kept the capital projects reserve fund at the reduced level. I bumped the contingency back up. Um, I went back to scenario four, which was the one that we threw out at the previous um, meeting where we um, we gave a, a slight or a slight benefit to the business class, and I said, and this one was very com was complicated to figure out. I said, if I give the business class the same benefit that they had under scenario four, I could also take sixty thousand dollars and reduce the all the other classes, <coughs> so we can have sort of a, a benefit for everybody. Um, 
So you can see from here, the tax revenue increase for business went down to 1.3%, and all the other classes went from 2.23 down, or from 2.49 to 2.23. Um, again, the downside of this is the surplus funds of 60,000 that I used for all those other property classes, they only got to see 16,000 of that because we lost $43,000 in that. And then again, the, the tax burden shifted from 38.58 coming from PELT to 38.52 coming from PELT, which seems like small numbers, it's 0.06%, but when you're talking um, um, $26 million, it, it has an impact overall. So then I went to scenario eight, which is the scenario, um, as you all know from my report, that I'm recommending. In the absence of a long-term strategy with no financial impact, um, I've recommended that scenario eight is the one uh, that we should go with for this year. And this is where all property classes experience the 2.49%. Um, we, um, we don't end up with a surplus because what I recommend is that we put the contingency and the capital project reserve fund back up to their historic levels, and that you establish a reserve for future expenditure of $60,000. Um, and I'm recommending that because, and I got, we got into this briefly at the last meeting, and that is, I would rather take that $60,000, put it in reserve, not have to use it if those future expenditures don't come up, and being able to roll it into next year and reduce um, the, the, the tax rates then, then lose 40,000 of it to Pelt and our properties only see 15,000 of it. I'd rather use the full 60,000 to our benefit. Um, so in this, in this um, scenario, you would have a reserve fund for future expenditures of 60,000, your contingency and your capital project reserve fund are at their historic levels, and you have a 2.49% tax increase. So that went fairly quickly, actually. That's the eight scenarios. So what I've done here to just to keep it up on the board. So at this this rate, you can see um, you have that's the fifty nine thousand um, dollars is your surplus. I'm saying uh, I like even numbers, so I'm saying create a reserve for sixty thousand. You keep your your health properties paying thirty eight point five eight percent of the tax burden for the municipality, which is um, uh, the level that it was at last year. So I, I just summarized all of them briefly on this page so that you can, for your discussion, you can refer to this. Um, so right now we have eight scenarios. We had nine, but one was a throwaway. It was just to show the impact of our health properties and our tax rates. So. Thank you. Before I open it up for question, I, I want to express my thanks uh, because this, in my recollection, is the first time we've actually really broken this down and looked at it in a number of ways. And it's something that I have been wanting to do for a number of years. So I appreciate the, the depth that you've gone to with eight scenarios to, to make your point. And I think you did. Okay. Uh, that being said, uh, what I would like to do, if you wouldn't mind, just before I open it up for discussion, is to go back to scenario two and if you could just run through that again, Lori, for us, because we glossed over it this week, and yes. I'd like to freshen my memory because the numbers are lower. Okay, so <laughs> scenario two, and I'll just go back to my notes in a second. Uh, so scenario two, 2.23%. So this was where we put the contingency back up to its historic level. We put the capital project reserve fund back up to its previous level. And we took uh, the surplus and just didn't collect it. But we didn't specifically collect it, not collect it from one property class. We said overall we're not collecting um, that uh, additional money. So we were able to go from 2.49% down to 2.23%. So that would be my option number two. If I had a plan B, that would be plan B. Because it keeps the ratios the same. Um, it gives uh, a lower tax rate to everybody in this probably only, The only thing you don't have compared to option A, scenario A, is the reserve fund for future expenditure. But it doesn't manipulate those relationships and it doesn't shift the tax burden. Thank you. So just to clarify, 
the difference here is that we don't end up with that $60,000 that could be set aside for policing costs. The $60,000 was, was just not collected, which is, 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 the, is how we get from 2.49 down to 2.23. We just don't collect it. Okay. Thank you very much. And I have a speaking list, and it's uh, Councillor Hodgins first. Thank you, through the Chair. And yes, kudos, uh, Ms. Hurst and your staff, for being able to provide us with the various options especially the really clear information around the pill because I think that was somewhat confusing as we tried to compare the numbers previously and when you juxtapose that with respect to certainly my desire and I'm sure to my colleagues as well to look for a more equitable platform for the business community but we certainly wouldn't want to do that while we're you know, negatively and significantly impacting our, our budget dollars in other areas. So this has been very, very helpful. And it, it, it leads us then for future, future discussions around how we can address the challenges with the, the business community, and at the same time respectful of our residential community. And, you know, when I look at the numbers and when I look at some of the history, it's probably a good time for us as we consider our future to even look beyond what we do currently in the one-year planning cycle for budgets and you know to better help the staff prepare for a long term and I think that would be a good discussion to have as we consider budgets uh, going forward and look for you know perhaps uh, three-year terms for budgets as opposed to uh, every year we you know, spend so much time effort and energy focusing on the budget so uh, thank you very much Thank you. Ms. Harris, would you like to speak to sort of the five-year um, projections that we do in terms of? Um, I will briefly. I, 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 we do do the five-year five -year plans on our budgets, but we haven't to date taken our tax rates and projected those out for five years, and I think that's what you're mm -hmm. alluding to. And that's what we'll be able to do when we do this master plan, is we'll be able to, to do those in parallel and, and have our budgets, have our projected tax rates. And obviously, as with the budget, you have a five-year plan. And as each year becomes the current year, you do a little bit of tweaking. So we just have to be careful that um, it isn't that we're very clear that those are five-year projections and that they will, they're not written in stone and that they will change depending on what, what comes up. But it's a, it would be um, a very beneficial uh, process for us to start doing is to, is to do that by your projection of the tax rates based on the budget. Thank you. Councillor Morrison. Um, just thank you. Uh, I also add to the accolades. I think this is uh, a fantastic amount of information, all extremely uh, focused at bringing some property tax relief this year. Um, I think that's appreciated by this council and, and certainly by this community and these continue to be difficult economic times for everybody. Um, so just a couple of questions before I choose my scenario here. So uh, going all the way back to one of the original scenarios we discussed in quite a bit of detail last meeting, scenario, scenario one, and the only difference between scenario one, this one clear, and scenario eight, which you're recommending, is the size of that special reserve fund. For, yes. for the policing. Absolutely. But the, cap, the, the capital reserve and the contingency fund are the same. Is that correct? Um, scenario one, the contingency and capital project reserve fund were at the reduced levels. So there is a difference there. So Let's scenario see. one, we, we reduced our contingency by 50,000 and we had reduced our capital project reserve fund contribution by 60,000. That's scenario one, which contributes to that $169,000 surplus. Under scenario two, there's no surplus, but what we did is we put the contingency and the capital project reserve fund back up to their historic level, so that ate up 110,000 of that 169. Um, and then we took the $59,000 and reduced the tax rate. Gotcha, okay. And in between scenario two and scenario eight, um, the only difference is the size of the uh, uh, $60,000 in scenario eight, 
for the special reserve fund right. that's facing, and the other one was, was there wasn't at all. Right. right. Okay. So there. So to narrow it does still allow for for, for a, a reserve of a smaller amount of reserve. Okay. Instead of using that sixty thousand to reduce the tax rate, you put it in the reserve. And everything yes. everything else was the same between those two scenarios. Yes. Okay. So my consideration there's basically comes down to three crucial points. Um, number one consideration, probably the highest ranked of, uh, if there is a ranking of these considerations, but they're all e pretty much equally important, is to provide some property tax relief to the community. Um, and to, that means keeping property tax rates as low as possible for 2012. So that's number one consideration. The number two consideration um, is that we, that we do that, in, we do that in a very responsible fashion. So that what I'm saying, what I mean by that is the the way a municipality can keep taxes lower uh, and keep them low year to year is through responsible, forthright planning, as we discussed earlier, and has been pointed out on many occasions that not all municipalities do this uh, equally, and some are are less responsible than others, or some are more responsible than others, and we're certainly uh, in a position to do this because of that level of responsibility. I think scenario eight accomplishes both those two um, considerations. There's something else that I want. To do. Oh, and of course, uh, the, the third consideration, this is, this is also extremely important, is to keep those contingency funds and to keep those uh, capital reserve funds as healthy as possible. And again, as I said with, with uh, priority number two, is that it does, uh, the only way we can do that in a responsible manner is we keep those funds in a very healthy state. Um, and I think our community is known for that. Um, and that's why our infrastructure is able to be taken care of when it's cheaper to take care of it as, to, as opposed to when it's falling apart and much more expensive to take uh, care of that. And we have neighbor, neighboring municipalities who are going through that right now. We are not. Um, and hopefully we will continue to be in a situation where we don't have to face that. And I believe Really, scenario two or scenario eight, but I, I, I do feel more comfortable with scenario eight because of that consideration. Thank you. If I can ask a question around contingency fund, then uh, this year we've had to uh, fund uh, policing. Did where did that funding come from? We actually had budgeted for that, so we did have that in the budget. Okay. Um, if we hadn't had it in the budget, the contingency is where we would have gone to get that funding. Okay. So contingency can be used for those those things if, uh, and, and uh, what, um, just off the top of your head, what did we, do we have any idea what we started with contingency this year and what we, what we ended up spending on? Um, contingency has historically, we put $250,000 because of the size of the budget, we're comfortable with the $250,000 contingency as an after budget account that's not in a reserve fund. Um, and I, last year, do you, do you know how much we used last year? I think it was, I think we used 110,000 instead of 250, which is probably more than we've used in any other year before. We, um, which is a good position to be in. That means no, that not that many surprises came up, which is means um, not many additional activities or, or request the board of council or we did a really good job budgeting. Um, but either way, the most we've ever used of the 250,000 that I could find going back as far as when I started in 2004 was 110,000. Okay, thank you. And if that, sorry, I just wanted to add to that, if that money isn't used, it just becomes surplus at the end of the year. But con and contingency is, is actually an account that we budget Council ha it has to have a council resolution to spend it. Staff can't tap into it. Um, the auditors check it at the end of the year. Contingency requires council to authorize the spending of that money throughout the year. Okay, thank you. Um, council, the reason I'm asking the, the questions around that is uh, these two scenarios, scenario two and scenario eight, uh, both have benefits. Uh, I see the value in setting a reserve fund aside for policing costs. Um, but I also see that uh, we have the opportunity this year to, uh, you know, tweak ourselves down that little extra 
and still have uh, talked up our funds fully in contingency and um, uh, the other fund. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still sort of feeling like it would be really nice to provide a lower rate. I'm going to continue with Council's comments and questions. Councillor Hundley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, compliment uh, our CAO uh, for this incredible amount of information. I really didn't understand before, uh, for all the budgets that I've been through, exactly how that impact is. And so I think that having a master plan will give us so much more information. And, and this is a, an excellent beginning for us um, going down that road. So I uh, have been a staunch proponent of uh, maintaining our contingency amounts and our capital projects reserve fund. I believe that this municipality has been carefully managed, very carefully managed, that we are not in a position where we are unable to do the things that we really need to do. I think that scenario eight is a conservative funding um, scenario. I think it provides all the things that we need and still is below the cost of living that's been pegged to 2.8%. So I believe that 2.49 is still a very reasonable way to go compared to what I see in other municipalities. So I I'm going to uh, support uh, number eight because I believe that it takes us down that road of continuing to look at our careful management, knowing that we will have some challenges in the future. So I'm um, thinking. Councilor, are you making a motion? Uh, I will make the motion then uh, with uh, to go with staff recommendation mm -hmm. as printed on page 10. Second. Thank you. Councilor Green? Though I don't disagree with uh, with option eight because it's still far lower than uh, Langford who's touting having the lowest at 2.9 in the region. So either way, we're still coming out ahead. But my only thought behind the 2.23 is we lowered local grants considerably to keep the taxes as low as we could possibly get them. Contingency is just that for the possibility of needing more money for policing. <coughs> I would prefer to see us go for the, the 2.23 to honor the fact that we lowered the local grants by a considerable amount of money to really lower the taxes. And contingency is just that for the, the unforeseen. So I would prefer option two. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to the motion? Councillor Shinman. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, again, my Compliments to staff this is a very well prepared document. I'm in, uh, inclined to agree that scenario eight is the one that I would support. And my reason behind that is I'm a firm believer too in maintaining our reserves. And we know we've got infrastructure issues coming down the road. We know we've got things we've got to fix and what have you. And the only way to do that is to maintain our, our capital reserves and our other reserve funds. And I think this uh, scenario for the budget accomplishes that very nicely. And Your Worship, that's why I'm supporting the brief. Thank you. Councilor McConnell. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm going many thanks to the CAO for all these numbers. Um, I don't have a calculator big enough to go through them all. But listening to what my fellow councillors have said, um, yeah, we need to keep the consistency fund alive because we don't know what our increasing is right now, so we don't know that we're gonna get hit with the bill and what's gonna happen. So I do agree with keeping it open, but I also agree with Councilor Drain that we lowered our grant because two of us were on the grant committee and we're the ones that gotta make the decision. And we just lowered that. So if we went with the number two, that's showing everybody but uh, I still like number eight myself, even though I agree with the council and and again, thank you very much for all what you've done. Answer question. Uh, just a question for clarification uh, around uh, <coughs> scenario two. 
there's a page that shows with that scenario, for example, a residential increase would be $50. Yeah. For scenario eight, sometimes are important when right. you consider. Right. And, and thank you also for the clarification when I was speaking to longer term budget planning, I was very much speaking to the issue of what we will be doing every year for that tax rate. And if we could get to a place where just for example, we'd say for the next three years, we're going to be at 3% per year. Our workload which isn't all that important, but our workload would be reduced significantly. The staff's workload would probably go down by 30% around how much you have to put in annually to do all of this. So that's what I'm thinking in terms of when we're back together in our discussions about where we could be and how we could be much more effective and efficient as a, a corporation to address the, the annual challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morrison. Just a quick question, just so we're all clear, um, because I do hear the points and, and the concerns about uh, the benefits of going with scenario two as well as, as another option. But I think it's what's, what's crucial with that question is the police uh, reserve fund, special fund, if it isn't used, then it will basically go towards 2013. Or, and and what I'm, where I'm going with this is that there could be a possibility of a tax benefit or tax further tax reduction for 2013 because we never used that money we never had to use that money we just roll it over to the next budget and we could take that right off the top so there automatically would be that that same amount of reduction for, for next year and i know it's not that neat or that perfect but but it is it is entirely possible that, is, that is one of the decisions that you could make to do with that when we have money in the reserve fund um council by resolution can and um, dissolve that reserve fund and use that money for what uh, another purpose. And you could, that is one of the one purposes. One of the purposes, okay. And, and that's important to me, I think. I, I don't want to see this, this low of a tax uh, change uh, for one year only, and then we go back to our, right. you know, our, our more um, established uh, uh, tendency to have it quite a bit higher than, than what we're talking about tonight. So, and as Councillor Hodgins and others have said, it's important to look at that long term. And that's really where I want to go with this. I do think if we go with scenario two, it does limit us somewhat in that with that chunk of money if we don't have to use it for policing. Um, and if we go with, with scenario eight, it does open the door for, for some future use of that money towards next year. And and the, it's sort of a domino that for each year afterwards that we're constantly putting more and more money forward that could help us to keep those taxes low year after year, not just a one, one shot deal. So thank you. Councilor Green. <laughs> Kevin, I have to ask the question. You said if we went back to scenario one and looked at the 2.49, are those numbers the same all the way down? Because like it was a two point so in scenario one, that was 2.49 straight down, which is what we're talking about doing, like all the yes. different rate classes. You actually look at the rate class difference. If we wanted to give business a bit of a, you know, if we wanted to help our economic development a bit, in a sense, I'm looking at the increases for the 2.3. There's actually a significant difference between, um, like if you look at some of the other industries, the, ch the, the numbers are a lot higher in the 2.49, down to the s scenario eight, sorry. If you can compare the scenario eight, 2.23, all the way across the board, and the 2.49, it seems to hit. Scenario eight is 2.49. Or, sorry, the two, no, scenario two, sorry. Okay, so sorry. scenario two is 2.2, oh, so you're comparing, Scenario yeah. one and scenario two. Just because we need that 2.49 comparison, right? Right. Um, because we didn't have those numbers. So, I mean, if you look at those numbers all the way down, there some of them are, are they seem to be like the industrial, major industry, 
That's a big 1,077 uh, 1, compared to 965. I mean, there are some, some more varying numbers in there. I don't know. I love the fact that we get to quibble over this. Actually. It's really not a bad thing, but I'm <laughs> any little savings is, is, is helpful. I just wanted to bring Council's attention to the fact that if you look not just at residential, which is maybe only the difference of $6, but if you look at major industry, that's uh, well, it's almost a hundred. It's over a hundred dollars. There's a, a bit of further discussion. Uh, as I said earlier, I have great difficulty in making a decision. I don't think there uh, is a negative in these two options. Um, upside or upside? Upside or upside, and. Um, you know, to to set aside a fund for leasing, I you know we've we recognized that we've needed it in the last couple of years. Uh, that being said, I still think that we have the opportunity through contingency to do that, and uh, so uh, just because I've been striving and striving to try and figure out how we can get this lowest rate uh, and still feel comfortable with the funds uh, at an appropriate level. Um, recognizing that, that I hope that we will need funds for policing. Um, I'm, I'm not going to support this motion in, uh, on principle that I feel that I would really like to see us go that little bit lower. As I said, though, I don't think there's a negative here. So I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Those opposed? Thanks very much. Uh, I think staff, thank you. This has been a wonderful discussion. Council, before we move on, I would like to uh, request your, I have a motion that we missed last time. It's about the local grant, or the, um, well, I'll just read it. I move that the $2,115 be taken out of grants. That was the money that we needed um, for membership for Tourism Victoria. Right now it's as a line item in local grants and have it included with Legislative Council membership fees, Tourism Victoria. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. Discussion? It was just strictly a, a misplaced line and we were supposed to do it last time and we forgot. Thanks very much. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Uh, and before we go on, Council, uh, I would uh, request your consideration of uh, making a motion toward next year so that we can give staff that direction to uh, fully explore uh, so that we do come out next year with something that we can provide as uh, looking at a, a benefit or, or reducing the burden on municipal businesses or providing an incentive so the net result at the end of the day is ensuring that we are encouraging business in Esquimalt. Uh, so, so, just as you made a motion earlier to say, we want you next year to look at how do you redu reduce that down even further, uh, I think it's, it's just um, good sense that we provide the direction now so that staff can prepare as they go through the year toward that business incentive, which will come in under the economic plan, but we want it to occur by next budget year. And I'll open that for discussion. Yeah. Councillor Hutchins. Through the chair, I, I support the intent. I understand where you would like us to be in providing direction so we don't lose the fact that we're looking for, we are looking for a more equitable playing field for business industry and residential. Perhaps we would want to set aside some time to have a more wholesome discussion at council around the whole notion of our budgeting process and cycle so that, you know, for, as I suggested, if we could look at a three-year term and provide a rate consistent over three years, and that's just an idea that needs, obviously, you know, a discussion at council, and that would be a good opportunity to talk about uh, how we can maybe best provide some direction for staff to help us get to where we want to be so that Esquimalt has one of the better rates across the uh, CRD for 
business industry and residential taxation. So just thought, as opposed to try and provide some direction this evening, if we could maybe have the opportunity to brainstorm and think about what that might be, direction may be more clear. Thank you, and I, and I think that's what I'm trying to get at, is however we do it, I don't want to come to this process next year and say, okay, we can't do it now because we're in, in the process. How do we get it so that we've given the direction well ahead of time so that staff knows what we're looking for toward next year? I could certainly and make a motion that the... Uh, your thoughts are, are around your tax rate, if I can just finish off. Oh, sorry. Um, are a part of that so that we provide complete direction starting now toward next year's uh, ideas. And I'll just go to staff and then if you want to finish your sentence, thank you. I was just gonna add another brief conversation with Dale. Um, the master plan um, that's coming forward to council will be coming forward in late fall, which is when staff start putting together the budgets for the, for, for the next year. Um, and part of that master plan would incorporate and have those discussions with the council about what our end goal is and those objectives of the matching the three-year plan. We would incorporate right into the master plan in April 6th. And, um, and so in putting that master plan together, I think those discussions with the council will be a part of that. And those objectives of matching the financial plan up with the tax rate strategy and getting to a point, like say, for instance, saying in the next three years we want to reduce the Those will be objectives that will be set out as part of that master plan. So um, if you do a motion, um, I would suggest that it would be in relation to that master plan coming forward and the timing of that because all of that direction could be part of that. And those objectives, you would give that direction by setting those objectives in that master plan. That's what I would suggest. Councillor Hodges, did you want to say? Well, yes, and I was actually going to make a motion so that we could discuss it in more detail. But uh, my motion would be that we enter into a business strategic planning on the financial side the process that is linked and connected directly to our master planning process in the short term so that by the time we get to uh, the fall, we have some clear direction around where we would like to be collectively. So it would be, that motion would be to enter into a, a business financial planning process now connecting to our master planning process. And that's, so you're putting that on the floor as a motion? Second. And uh, staff, do you see that that achieves the same uh, as, as what yeah, you're suggesting? Yeah, 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 it does. And we'll, Thank you. we'll certainly work through that. Um, and, and um, of course, we actually take into account the legislation and what we're, what, what, we're restricted in doing, but that would probably part of those discussions. Yeah, I, I think that would Thank you. Councillor Hundleby. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I'm sort of very interested in this process, and I wondered if it would be helpful to have earlier than late fall, but an outline as to what this might look like, including what you had suggested about the different rates and how we go, but, but actually have it out there so that we say, okay, this is what we're expecting to get. That way, then we would have an opportunity and say, maybe the whole have a discussion and say, well, maybe we could have this and add a little bit just to make sure that we've covered everything that we would want. Is that possible to, to, to staff? Through the chair, um, yes, we have another side con sidebar conversation here. We can, as staff, bring forward a report that sets out um, how we intend to get to that late fall report and the stages in between. We can, and we can bring that forward in the short term. Set out the strategy. That would be great. So, is that part of this motion, or is this? Do we need that, to make it? This is what I was speaking to. Is this process so we know now we have a process map to move forward, so that come fall we have something to present that we've all had a chance to consider, contemplate, and discuss, knowing about all of the legislation and other rules of context that we need to connect. Yes, very much what you just said. Thank you. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? None opposed? Staff? I just wanted to add to that another sidebar conversation. 
we should be able to bring um, that forward as a staff report to the committee of the whole in May. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for, for working with us. Uh, <coughs> so did I hear we are uh, currently beating the Yes. Yeah. yes. Put, put I think they've claimed the lowest tax rate in the region, but we're going to, you might have to be thrown in. That feels good. Point, point of information, too, I, the, the last meeting, we had, I think I'd asked the question if, if, if it was ever through archives or whatever else, uh, an ability to find out the last time our tax rates were at that low of a rate. And I know that you said in the decade you've been here, it yeah. never was the case. So I, I think that if in the public messaging that we're sending out, it's not just that we're beating Langford and that perhaps it could be the lowest, but also that it's the lowest since, I don't know, 1980 something, 1990 something, I don't know. So. We can certainly ask that question. I'm sure they have that information. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Now I call the question uh, so we can now move on. And, and again, thanks to staff for the hard work. We move on to animal control. Yeah. I just wanted to thank you for um, the acknowledgement of the work and beg your indulgence. I have, I have a broken one at home that I want to <laughs> take care of. So. Yes, please do. Priorities are important. Family's important. And thank you for coming tonight. Okay, we are moving on to animal control. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Nervo. Uh, do you have anything for to add to this uh, report? Thank you. I can just uh, point out, we did on the agenda include another public offer, uh, public input opportunity just oh. after we talked about public uh, rates and other better do that. Thank you. So, uh, public, you now have more opportunity to speak. Uh, is it, are there any members of the public that wish to speak? Any members of the public that wish to speak? Any members of the public that wish to speak? Seeing none, thank you very much. And now we'll move on to animal control. Anything further to add to the report? Excuse me, could you please use the mic? Thank you. Um, I was just going to say that the uh, report, uh, I think, is self-explanatory. Uh, these are the procedural requirements in order to uh, implement the new uh, animal control contract that was approved recently by Council. Uh, the first three points have to do with um, uh, amendments required under our uh, animal control bylaw and our Getting information bylaw as well to allow the uh, our new animal control officers to um, actually enforce our bylaws. And the third one are some uh, revisions, um, just uh, uh, technical revisions required to our animal control bylaw uh, again to make the necessary requirements. So I'm asking for first, second, and third duties to the animal control bylaw attached and, um, and to make the um, uh, recommendations there on page one. Thank you. Councillor Hundleby. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank our manager of corporate services for looking after the details. Um, I'm very glad that we're doing <coughs> it. It's an important part of um, the work that we do when it finishes off. So with that, I would uh, move the staff recommendation as written on page 12. Second. Councillor Green. Um, I happen to be speaking to our new animal control people. Um, not in a bad capacity. My dogs have licenses. <laughs> But um, after talking it's to yeah, <laughs> Ian Fraser, um, who is the operator of uh, that, and he said if there's any members of council who would wish to tour the facilities, um, he is more than welcome. You know, he says that the doors are open and we are free to come down, either singularly or as a group, to tour the facilities. And he also made a couple of comments. One was uh, he's had residents stop him already going, really, we, we have animal control? so. Um, he uh, has already been out in the neighborhood and people are noticing. And uh, he did say that, uh, and staff is aware of that there are a few changes within the bylaw itself to make it a little bit more enforceable. And I'm assuming staff has, is working on that for the near future. Yeah. Thank you for your discussion. Councillor McCann. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Um, 
One question that we brought up on that, was this going to be flexible hours, like is it Monday to Friday, or are we going to split it up so that uh, all of a sudden he shows up on a Saturday and Sunday and we can catch a whole pile of dogs? Or owners, I mean? Not <laughs> <laughs> I that. Uh, he did um, uh, say that the contract itself that we um, uh, entered into with uh, them allowed for patrolling off hours as well. They do uh, work seven days a week and uh, vacations included, so they will be doing uh, sporadic and uh, um, off times as well. That's, that's all built into the contract. Super, that's good to hear. Great, any further discussion? If not, I'll call the question. All those in favor? None opposed, motion is carried, thank you. Miller, we have option for sidewalk location on Worsley Street. Your Worship, uh, the report itself is um, fairly clear. Uh, I would like to extend my compliments to the residents along Worsley Street who took it upon themselves to have a number of discussions among themselves to come to a consensus. Um, those discussions were mainly among the six residential homes along the corridor. Uh, I have not received any information from the uh, larger complexes at the end of the street, but as there are more users of the street, uh, of the sidewalks, rather than having it situated in front of their homes, I'm very appreciative that those residents took the effort to get their feedback to us to help present this report. Thank you. Questions for staff? I'll move staff recommendation. I'll second it. Thank you. Any further discussion? Just Councillor Morrison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we, if you, thank you for, for the report and also for mentioning, acknowledging the input from the residents and, and we certainly heard it here through the budget uh, discussion as well. I think what I took from that, while there was different Preferences. Uh, the primary goal was to make the street safer and do that by having a new sidewalk. Um, not everyone's going to agree with the location, but we've achieved the primary and the most important uh, goal here, which is to, as I said, make that a safer place for pedestrians on a permanent basis. Um, and so I think we can do that for $22,000 versus the other uh, alternatives, um, which were more. <coughs> I think that is probably the most public safety conscious step forward and also the most, and this is important, fiscally responsible uh, step forward. So, um, and I think that the, the local residents will see it that way as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, I as well wanted to say how uh, I'm pleased with the public involvement here. The, the genuine engagement of the public being able to influence the process and the back and forth, which uh, we did hear from the residents. They wanted to be involved, they were allowed to be involved, and we had a win-win situation and scenario. So thank you, Mr. Miller, and thank you to the public for being involved. Thank you. Councillor Shinman. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'm going to be supporting the, this motion also, but I just wonder, uh, since there was concern about uh, I'm putting the sidewalk down the south side of the, the, the road. Is it possible that that could be left in as a future budget item, that if and when time comes or whatever, that we could still do that? Or once if we put the street, I guess what I'm saying is, if we put the sidewalk on the north side, is that the it for that street? Or could this still be brought forward at a later time when there's money or whatever to, to relook at that? Your Worship, due to the councillor, um, anything's possible. I guess when you look at Squamal itself, um, especially south of the Squamal Road, there's a number of streets that don't have sidewalks at this time. Um, I guess before I would go back to Worthley, I would, uh, and we had budget money available, I guess my goal would be to see every street with a sidewalk, at least on one side. So. I would think that uh, going back is a possibility, but it probably would be a possibility further into the future um, than nearer in the future. Thank you, Mr. Uh, my only concern is, uh, 
I'm, I'm very glad that we did get a public input, and I, I think that's been helpful. My only concern is that we didn't really receive a lot of input from the larger buildings, which, which may have a high number of people that continue to go down the south side, uh, in which case, um, is our money well spent? And I'm wondering what the process was to try and engage the, those people in those buildings. Your Worship, uh, it wasn't a defined um, effort to go and talk to those uh, homeowners per se or the building owners per se. Again, uh, getting information from the residences along the trail where who are whose property, I guess, is more impacted by having a sidewalk either on the north or south side, I would say carried a little more weight. Um, generally, people will, if there's a dry place to walk, uh, they will go and use that facility rather than walk on a muddy side. Um, I think you'll see the residents of those apartment complexes use north side. There will be some that will still use the south side, but I think you'll see the majority moving on to the north side just because it is a dry place to walk and you're off the street and such. Thank you. And the second part of my question was if, if we went to the 36,000 scenario, how would that impact our budget? Uh, this money is coming out of the capital project reserve, so it's not going to affect the tax rate at all. It's just going to reduce that capital project reserve by that amount. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to support this, but what I'd like to do is uh, is sort of uh, suggest that when we have, and we have a, just a few of these streets where we have a large number of multi-residential buildings, that in order to, to get input from those, it will require probably going an extra step. And, and where that kind of input is required, I think we want to take that extra step in the future. I'm thinking of places like Carlton Place, if we're looking at, because there, this is a scenario that could go either way, and, and 36,000 versus 22,000. You know, to, to get the best use and the, and the, the, the you know the, the most safety. Um, to me, that that difference isn't that significant. So the question still ends up in my mind: Did we get a full enough public consultation? But um, I appreciate the consultation we did, and just for the future, if there are ways that we can get at those multi-family buildings <coughs> for, for greater input. I think it, it, it would be of us to do that. Mm -hmm. So, I, Councillor Morrison? Just so I wanted to be, just so we close the loop on that issue of north versus south, I think it's important to put in the context that what currently is, is no sidewalk. So, uh, what human behavior does is they just choose whatever side is more, more convenient to them because there's no motivation to choose either one of the sides. Um, but once we install that north side sidewalk, human behavior instinctively adapts, it changes, and if there's a motivation to use the north side because there's a nice new sidewalk there, as opposed to, as, as uh, our uh, director of engineering said, uh, walking through mud, and that's a big part of, a big chunk of, of the year uh, in, our, in our climate. So I, I think we're trying to look at it in today's terms, and what we should look at it is in tomorrow's terms, once the sidewalk is there, and once people have changed their habits to adapt to that side, sidewalk location, it will no longer be an issue. I really believe that. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's just around the question of why we're having this discussion now versus it approving it the first time around, and that was the indication of so South. Councillor Hundleby. Oh, thank you. I support the comments made by Councillor Morrison. The other part of it that I would say is there is a difference of $14,000, and it means that another area of Esquimalt can have a sidewalk a little sooner. And so I, I'm in favor of, of having uh, going to safety and the, uh, the, the least amount of um, uh, uh, cost because we have a fiduciary duty. Thank you. Great. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion's carried. Thanks very much. 
We have uh, the report from Mr. Brown on Heritage Road recognition and registration. And uh, this is uh, to be received uh, for information from the council. Any questions for staff? Mr. Brown, do you want to add anything to your report? No, I have no additional information. Great. Council? Move the staff recommendation. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. None opposed. We move on to the report on um, response to the letter from West Bay Residents Association. Um, Ms. Mr. Brown, um, before I go to you, I just want to say to Council uh, and the public um, that in looking at this report, as this is about giving staff direction to prepare uh, a discussion paper and a report, um, I don't uh, feel that I'm in, in conflict. Uh, should a proposal come forward from the West Bay area, I would have to refuse myself. Uh, but this is all about council giving direction to staff regarding uh, developing a report. So with that being said, um, I will uh, go to uh, ensure that you have on your uh, additional agenda, you have a letter from West Bay, whatever it is, um, from Mr. Linko. Uh, however, that is with respect to a development proposal that is in process, has not come forward at this point. <coughs> and we are looking at a staff report that talks about um, developing a process toward better development or development in, in West Bay and an overall strategy. I will turn it over to you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillors. As mentioned, we are currently processing the rezoning development permit, ap permit application. And in doing so, it has uh, responded, or several people in the area have sent notices and letters and emails to Council and Mayor staff and I've been asked to respond. In reviewing the uh, official community plan, there's only really one policy that governs any rezoning or development in this area, and that's uh, policy 2.3.6, which states the waterfront lands around West Harbor, West Bay Harbor, as shown in Schedule A, will function as a marine oriented commercial village serving regional marine traffic, local residents and tourists, is strongly encouraged that the marine commercial area be orientated to pedestrians and local traffic. <coughs> That's a very good overarching policy statement, but it really doesn't give uh, planning department and council and the public, and for that matter developers, a great deal of guidance in what's expected as we develop this incredible jewel in a squamo. I believe, as a professional planner, that there's a need for a few more guidelines to guide us as planners in our review, to guide council, to guide the public, and to guide developers. And the type of thing I'm thinking about is not another West Bay local area plan. That was a lot of detail and shouldn't have been an OCP. I am thinking more of some of the stuff that Victoria has done, uh, especially with view corridors. As you walk along the trail and even looking towards the supply mall, it's incredibly important that we protect the integrity of that view. And it's also important that we protect the integrity of the view out towards the harbor. It's important that any new development there be connected, uh, both within the neighborhood and to adjacent neighborhoods. It's important that there's, uh, we maintain public uh, access to the area. And these are all things that aren't currently uh, policies or guidelines in the community. <coughs> it's also um, important that we think very carefully about how development in that area goes forward. And that, that's all done through design guidelines. And the design guidelines that currently uh, govern that area are the same guidelines that govern any commercial development along Esquimalt Road. Now, Esquimalt Road, commercial development in West Bay, are two different entities when it comes to the fine points of development. And I think it's important that there's a differentiation between those two areas. And so what staff are proposing is that we come back with a report to council that suggests uh, possible amendments to the official community plan 
that will help guide our decision making, council's decision making, our review process in the future for developments that come forward. So currently our recommendation is just that we bring back a report outlining all the things I basically come over and suggesting amendments to the OCP and council can make a decision. Do we amend the OCP or not? And the alternative recommendation in the staff report is if we just continue based on existing framework within the OCP that we don't do any further work and that's fine and we can we can work that way. But I think from a professional planning perspective, that's a little bit better if we have a few more uh, site-specific guidelines for the West Bay area. Is there any questions? Thank you. I'm just going to ask one question and I'm going to open it up to Council. And that is, what is the time frame that you are looking at with respect to providing this information? Again, I think it, the actual staff report can come back fairly quickly, um, probably as early as May. Uh, just for some ideas, uh, sort of the same kind of strategic framework that we just talked about for the economic development strategy. And then council can instruct staff to proceed or not proceed. Thanks very much. I have Councilman Hodges and then Hundleby. Uh, through the chair, uh, thank you, Mr. Brown. I really appreciate your, your uh, candid comments up front, and especially given your professional experience in this regard, and if there's more that we can do to bring better clarity around potential developments so as we look to make those decisions, we are making informed decisions based on a professional approach. So I really appreciate that uh, advice and feedback, and I support uh, what you would like us to uh, support. Thank you. 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 Thank you.